Good morning and welcome to Life Church. My name is T.R. Stewart. I'm the youth and associate pastor here. We're glad you've chosen to join us today. Stay tuned. The Sunday experience is about to begin. Good morning. Welcome to Life Church. Thank you. You know, I always, well, you may not know if this is your first time, I always wait for a response. So, welcome to Live Church. I'm glad you're here. Are you glad you're here? Stand with us this morning. Tell your neighbor, welcome. Okay, welcome. I'll tell you, I'll tell all your neighbors, welcome, 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 welcome. Let's stand together. Jesus, we love you. We dedicate this time to you. This time is to you, it's for you, and it's about you. Lord Jesus, because you are the only one worthy of any of our praise. So today we want to hold nothing back from you. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth today. And we ask that you would be honored. We ask that we would be made right so that we can appropriately honor you with our words and with our deeds in this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. The day you made, so I'll rejoice and be glad, rejoice and be glad in you. This is the day you made. So let 
Copy that, Sophia. At the first chorus, you can go sit down. Okay? Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the rain for my life oh he is let's sing that one more time let the king let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow
I just feel like I'm going to just share a tiny bit here. In my uh, Bible reading today, actually, the story of Jesus in the water when the waves were there and he was walking on the water, it's in the Bible a lot of times. So I've listened to it like the last three days because I'm doing that chronolo or the chronological study, right? And one thing that, I think we talked about it in a different study, but one thing that it points out in one of the versions of the story is that Jesus was just going to walk right on past where the boat was in the sea. He said he saw the guys in trouble. He was going to just walk past, just a little walking on water, just walk past him. But when he heard them calling him for help, he stopped. Right? Isn't that, is that right? Am I remembering this right? Just listened to it today and yesterday maybe the day before. But even in our first song, I feel like there's a lot of people present today that maybe your circumstances make it hard for you to see his goodness. Your circumstances are hard. It's making it hard to have the joy of the Lord that goes beyond what we feel, beyond what life tells us about him. And even in that little story, Jesus had other intentions. And he changed what he, his intentions were. And when he saw them in need and they were calling out to him for help, I mean, they thought he was a ghost. I don't know. But that was nice of him to be like, okay, no, it's me, Jesus. I'm here. But he came to their need. He came and he met their need where they were. I feel like that can be applicable to us today. But it takes us. He was going to walk past. They had to call out to him. It takes us calling out to him like, my circumstances are horrible, but Jesus, I need you. I need you to help me remember that you are good regardless of what's happening in my life, regardless of the 200% increase of candy, Jesus, you are good. And I need you to help me see that. And I feel like that, that story is a promise that he will stop and come to your aid and help you see his goodness, help you be reminded of his goodness. Whether that's just remembering another time that he came through for you when you were in another situation. Be encouraged today that he is good. He sees where you are. He cares about you. He wants good for you. Sometimes though, we have to walk through the valley just like we just talked about a few months ago or a month ago. So God, for those that are in the valley, for those that are in the middle of crisis, for those that are in the middle of struggle today, help them to see you and see your goodness. Remind them of your faithfulness to them. Remind them that you don't leave us, you don't forsake us, and just like we're about to sing, you never let us down. I hope that encourages someone in this place today. Remember his goodness. Remember his faithfulness. Think about testimonies from your own past of his goodness to you. Mm. You're never going to let, never going to let me die. You're never going to let, never going to Die. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me die. You're never gonna let. Declare that in faith today. You're never going to me die. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me die.
your mercies follow us all the days of our lives. Every single one. You don't miss one. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Oh, Lord. worthy is the Lord. the stars to their place and you call them by name and they hung there in silence just to see what you'd say and the wind picked up pace as you said it was good and the sun rose that day just to bask in our love and the clouds moved to get a glimpse of your face. And they sang, Holy is the Lord. They sang it out to you. They sang, Holy is the Lord. Oh, the sky.
Thank you, God, that there is truly none like you. Thank you, God, that you are set so far apart. <laughs> Nothing will ever come close to you. Good in all your ways, holy, perfect in everything. We worship you. We praise you. We do declare the holiness of God. for your presence with us. Thank you for your nearness to us. Thank you that you see us and you know us and you care about us. May we do our part to love you back to the best of our abilities. We serve a good God. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Just kidding. <laughs> Just thought I'd get you guys. Hey, how many of you are glad you're here this morning? Amen? How many of you realize what kind of God we serve and how great he is? I'm just going to say this. Jesus is the reason we're here. Amen? And not only that, but he upholds all things by the works of his hand, by the word of his hand. Like you think of this, excuse me, the word of his power. Um, I think of that and he's always done so. He, he, he who was and who is and who is to come. He's everywhere all the time. He stands inside of time and he also stands outside of time. And he's not just the beginning in creation, but he's also right now. And so I, I love this because scientists, mathematicians, I mean uh, astronomers, nuclear physicists, they're reeling to try to catch up with who he is because he's that great. And so... They can't even discover things without the sustaining power and authority of Christ. And so I say this, whole, the whole universe hangs on his powerful arms, his infinite wisdom and how great he is. And that's the God that you came in here to decide to say, hey, I'm going to lift my hands up to the King of kings and the Lord of lords this morning. That's, that's the heart behind what just happened. All of creation cries out to the God who is alive and well. Amen. And so this morning... I just have to say how great he is. I mean, you think about this. I mean, uh, scientists will even tell us if his ability to control, God's ability to control every single element and orchestrate movements of every molecular, atomic, and subatomic particle. I mean, you think about it so much so that even if the earth were to orbit the sun, and if it, had, if it increased or decreased just a little bit, we would fatally freeze or we would actually fry. I mean, you think about it, if the earth's angle of the tilt and tilt was held by his, if it's held by his, if it's not held by his power, I mean, it would drastically change our four seasons in, the, in life and on planet earth. And so if the moon's orbit changed, we would have tsunamis that would wipe all of us out. And so I just say this, don't tell me that you worship science. Please don't tell me that. Because I'm going to tell you something, the God who made it all to make it even discoverable to begin with is the one whom we're in this place to worship. That's the one whom we're here. And so, I mean, you know, to go along with our series, I just have to say, um, a lot of people who are worshiping a lot of other things, I mean, uh, listen, it's, it's idolatry. 
And that's the whole point of this series. Um, <laughs> I, I think of people like Charles Darwin who recanted on his deathbed. I'm saying this, I mean, to more modern times, things that have changed over time, things that have become discoverable. How many of you remember, how many of you are old enough to remember when, uh, when a gene was, they called it a unit of function? How many of you remember that? I mean, you, some of you are like, do you remember that? And I'm like, yes, I do. I remember it in school. I mean, a, a unit of recombination, they came out and later said, then it was a unit of mutation, and then it was a, it's an enzyme com- te- uh, a concept. And listen, let me tell you something. Let me tell you who created that. God himself, almighty, he's the one that has created it all. And so listen, there's things that we haven't even discovered yet. And my point is, what have we still not discovered? About his greatness. I mean, what, what will there be in a hundred years that we will be like, oh my goodness, we, we haven't even touched, we haven't even touched uh, uh, where he is and how great he is. Um, and so here's what's crazy, though, is we still act like we know what's going on and we know, what's, we know that we're in control. And the reality is, is that's laughable. Okay, I'm just going to say that. So um, the most delicate and microscopic processes do not escape God's, they don't escape God's attention. And so he's God. Um, this morning, if you're, I'm, I'm sorry, I just ranted. I, I just can't believe how great he is. I'm just, he, he's amazing. God is almighty. He's so powerful. He's so strong. Um, yeah, go ahead and give him a, an incredible praise this morning. He's that great. If you're joining us for the first time today, I don't always rant like that right away, but um, I'll do it later. But anyway, we've been in a series called Killing Idolatry and um, idolatry is expected from people in the world, but when we find it among those who, who have a covenant with God, people who are supposed to be following God, it, it's certainly dreadful, and the book of James um, refers to this kind of adultery as adultery, and, and it's labeled this because we have, uh, if you're a believer, you have a covenant with God. You have a, a relationship with God. And just like a husband or a wife who is unfaithful to his or her spouse, when we give o- ourselves over to idolatry, we are unfaithful to Jesus. And if you are a Christ follower, listen, a believer in the church, you have a bridegroom. His name is Jesus Christ. And as we've been throughout this, as we've seen throughout this series, there's only one cure for idolatry, and that's to kill it. You have to kill idolatry in your life, and you have to do that every single day. You have to wake up. You have to be like, I'm going to, nope, I worship him and him alone. This morning, I want to communicate truth to you about believers and idolatry, and I also kind of want to combine that with the concept of godly sorrow, and and I want to do that by reminding us of a story in the Old Testament, and I want us to begin in the Old Testament, and we're going to move kind of to the New Testament. Um, I'm not going to read it all to you, I promise, but uh, the rest of this message, we're kind of going to move from Old Testament to New Testament, but, but Israel, in the Old Testament, had a covenant with God, and it, and it originated with their father, Abraham. How many of you remember that song, or have you ever heard of that song, Father Abraham had many sons, many... Okay, we're not going to sing it, I promise you, but um, God had given... Israel's first king, King Saul, a a directive through the prophet Samuel. He said, there's some things I want you to do. And and here's what Samuel says from God to to Saul. He says, now listen to this message from the Lord. And and, and basically Samuel is getting his attention. In fact, if if you wanted to, I mean, there's no mistaking, uh, even if you wanted to, there's no mistaking that God wanted the king and Israel to, to hear what God was about to say. And so it was direct, it's to the point. And if you were to continue reading through the text, uh, basically what took place was the king, King Saul, was told to completely destroy this people group. And by by the way, uh, a lot of people don't understand that. When we get to the Old Testament, you're like, oh man, well, there was demonic things happening in that. And I'm saying this because we know from Genesis 6, um, uh, we don't know everything about it, but what we do know is that... uh, demons were messing around with people and so what happened was is there was a lot of uh, of nephilim what they called nephilim and from genesis chapter 6 that were in there and uh, amalek was one of those uh, people groups and so in other words every man woman and child that they were looking at god was saying hey king saul i, I need you to destroy that 
And it was, listen, it was God's revenge on Amalek who opposed Israel when they were fleeing Egypt and were at their most vulnerable. And by the way, if you're like, oh my gosh, this, this, I'm, I'm, having, I'm reeling right now just because of what you just said. God had people destroy people. God doesn't have people kill people uh, these days. Old Testament, um, God is like, destroy them all. I want you to do that. And we, we can have another sermon for another day for that. But So King Saul, he immediately rallies the troops and he mobilizes this army to attack Amalek. Now, however, I want you to notice these, these words in 1 Samuel 15, verses 7 through 9. says this, And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur. So far, so good, right? He, he's taking care of business, right? He did, he's doing what God said to do, right? And, which is east of Egypt. But now watch, verse 8. Take this out. He also took Agag, king of Amal- the Am- Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. He's supposed to destroy everything, but huh, look at those nice sheep. Hmm, look at those nice oxen. Some of you are like, what's the big deal? Well, that's money, just so you understand. The fatlings, the lambs. And all that was what? Good, right? And they were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But listen, everything despised and worthless. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I just need to go ahead and destroy that. So now, now, now when some, some people read this, you, you might not even see the fact that Saul didn't really do what he was supposed to do. Well, well, look at that. I mean, you know, Saul did what God said. I mean, basically. I mean, what's the problem, Tony? And, and it would appear... In, to many in Israel that Saul did obey the word of the God, of the word of the Lord. But yet right after this, I want you to hear, because sometimes it, it, God is not schizophrenic. He's not like, you know, one day happy, the next day, no, 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 that's not God. Yet right after this, we read the following statement in 1 Samuel 15, verse 10, says this, And the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command you may be like well what gives i mean why is god so mad i mean well for starters it just really comes down to this saul did not give god the worship the obedience nor the benefit of the doubt when it came to questionable things that god wants done And the reason I say questionable is because it would be questionable to just throw these sheep and these cattle out the window. It would be questionable to really kind of like not really understand the entire context of this verse and think that we're just killing people. We're not just killing people here. That's not what this is. I mean, so I mean, mean, couldn't we use it for worshiping God? I mean, couldn't we take these sheep and actually use them for the temple worship? I mean, Old Testament, remember we're talking about Old Testament temple worship. So, I mean, th- that would save us a lot of money for worshiping God in the future, right? I mean, I mean, these sacrificial lambs can get expensive, you know. And you might say, well, why did, the, why did he keep King Agag alive then? Well, that's easy. If you're a king and you want to show off, go ahead and bring back the king that you were supposed to kill and show him off. Look who I captured. I say this, it's, it, it was pride in King Saul's Hard, I'm Saul, and I conquered the Amalekites. See their king? Here he is. Look. Even though God said, wipe them all out. Now, we see, uh, by the way, um, just so you understand, this would bite them later because the Amalekites come back and they attack the southern border. And not only do they attack the southern border, but they carry off their women and children later on. All because a king decided that he thought he knew better than God. Let me just tell you something. You don't know better than God. I don't know better than God. God knows. And God knows everything. And God is all-knowing. And God is all-wise. And God is all... Yeah, you might be like, well, he's even all-loving. I mean, look what he just did. Listen, understand this. You have people groups that there are points where people say, you know what, God? They, they flip God off pretty much. And they're like, you know what? If that's how you're going to be, screw you. And I'm saying this. We, we, we see God saying, I've given these people a chance. 
And he does things the Lord says. And so, uh, well, Saul is supposed to be doing things the Lord said, but, but he just put his own twist on them. I, how many of you have ever done that? How many of you have ever had God speak to your heart about something that you're supposed to do? I want you to come up here and I want you to grab one of these over here that say $86. Yeah, but Lord, I only have 44 I mean, you know, I, I want you to grab one of these that says $81. Oh, but Lord, I only got, <laughs> I don't even have the one over here on the far left. It's 31 I don't even have that. And how many of you ever fought God like that? Anybody ever done that? Because you're rationalizing things. You're, you're trying to figure things out. And, and, and so, no, Saul, we, we, we see Saul doing a lot of what a, a lot of Christians do nowadays. And, and, and he does things the Lord said. But he just has to put his own twist on them. I got to do, I got, I'm going to try to be obedient to the Lord, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it my way. I want to do it Tony style, right? <laughs> and and what, that might sound great to you because, you know, I mean, well, I've got to be true to me, PT. I got to, you know, it has to be my style, you know. And, and I mean, it has to be, uh, you know, it has to be with a certain flair. I have a tendency for theatrics, you know, and I got to do things the way I do them because I'm just me. Well, listen, you know my truth, PT, right? Because I've got to be me. But one major problem with that is this, is that if your flair and your style take away from what God said to do, then there's a problem. We still call that disobedience. And so God, therefore, calls his disobedience, he calls it, I'm going to save you a lot of time because you go through the entire thing, but basically God calls him unfaithful. And I was, I was counseling a dad one time who was frustrated, and, and he's not here um, anymore. And uh, I'm saying that they moved away. And he was upset because the greatest challenge was his teenage son who usually only did partially what his dad asked him to do. And so how many of you have teenagers and you know that sometimes that happens? You tell them to do something and they only do part of what you said to do. The young man would partially do what his dad told him to do, but then went off and did what he wanted. And which usually was, was hanging out with his friends or something like that. And so when the dad confronted him, the kid got really upset and said, Hey, come on, dad. Are you kidding me? I mean, first of all, if you talk to me like that and you're one of my sons, it may be coming back at you if you said that, right? So, but really, dad, I mean, quit being so hard on me. Why are you being so hard on me, right? How many of you ever had your kid talk to you back? You know, you, you wanted like, you want to do something to him? In the name of Jesus, right? You want to, you know, uh, you know. Um, so let's lay hands on you right now. Suddenly. <laughs> anyway, you know. Dad, quit being so hard on me. I did 90% of what you told me to do. Why are you so picky? Anybody ever had your kids tell you that? Why don't you, why don't you look at the 90% that I did do? I mean, instead of the 10% I didn't do. And really now... We have entire generations full of that mentality today, but needless to say, the dad was frustrated, and some would say, well, you have, you have to pick your battles. I mean, you, well, why are you being so picky? What's the problem? I mean, kids are, let kids be kids, and kids are kids. And remember, I told you last week that, that your job as a parent is to help them learn to listen to you so that when they are old enough, they can learn to listen to God. The goal is not just listening to you, although that's a big part of the training, uh, but you are going to give them godly parenting. You're going to give them godly advice so that they want to listen to you, and then later they, wanna, they learn to listen to the voice of God. And what I would say to someone who says, well, why are you being so picky? Well, God must be picky too then. I'm saying this because when we see this, listen, and this is what the modern day church, especially in the United States, uh, uh, doesn't really get yet, and it's not painful enough yet. It's also why majorities of church, or majority of church attenders are aloof to the things of God, and that's this, the idea of partial obedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. Even more so, hear me, almost complete obedience is not even obedience at all either. Rather, it's rebellion. I mean, so it's, listen, it's you as a person not giving God the place of honor or the place of worship that is actually due to him and him alone. No, 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 Tony, no, you don't understand. I have, I have great sentiment toward the Lord. 
I have wonderful sentiment toward I. I think good thoughts of him. I worship him on Sundays, and then I go home, and I live my life. And, you know, I, he, he has Sundays for me. I'm good with that. Well, the only problem is, is he wants more than just Sundays. I mean, uh, he wants it all. He wants your life. He wants you. He wants, he wants to have you. He wants all of you. He wants your entire life. And so as the story goes, 1 Samuel 15, Samuel the prophet then confronts Saul and, and who, because he was so deceived, remember the idolatry comes in so many forms. We've looked at those over the last couple of weeks. And idolatry, idolatry also makes you blind to your own condition. And so Saul, flat out, what does he do? He, he, he denies the accusation. But then Samuel points out the animals that were being sacrificed. And so Saul was like, well, that's the people's fault. That's the people's fault. I mean, but Samuel corrects him. And no. <laughs> No, Saul, you're the one in charge. You're the king. You're the one who said this. You are the one who has disobeyed God. And once Saul is backed into a corner by the prophetic confrontation from Samuel, Samuel then states an amazing truth in regard to idolatry. And I want you to hear it. It says this, 1 Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from what? Being king. So now, for now, I want us to focus on the second statement in this passage because stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Stubbornness means, it's the idea behind it. If you look at the word, the original language there, it's the idea to push or to press. Saul is pushing back from truth, from complete obedience. The, the, the next word is, is as, in, in the verse, if, how many of you in your Bible, if you look at your Bible, um, how many of you have your Bible with you right now? Right now, hold your hand up. Okay, good. Um, how many of your, how many of your uh, Bibles have is as in the verse, are, they're, they're in italics? Anybody have that? It's italics in your version. Most of the, yeah, several people around have that. Uh, which means, what that means is, if it's in italics, it means that it's not in the original text. And the reason is, is there are no Hebrew words there. And the translator adds them to, to make it read better. And I say that because the better translation would be here, if you look at it, it would be this. Stubbornness is what? Idolatry. Idolatry. Real simple. I mean, so the reality is, is this, when, when, when someone knows the truth, when someone knows the will of God, when someone knows what God has spoken and yet pushes back and doesn't obey, the Bible says, that's idolatry. I mean, and the reason that is, is because, listen, when your will, when, I'm saying it for me too, for when my will or my agenda or my wishes or my desires or your wishes, your will, your desires are placed above God's desires, that's idolatry. I mean, so all these things come before him. And listen, we, we've, we've defined in the last few weeks, an idol is really anything that we put before God. And so let me just take this a little bit further because in discerning idolatry, whether or not you and I are really into idolatry, Pastor, how do I even know? I mean, we, we like to play my, how many of you realize that sometimes it's easy to play mind games with yourself? It really is. I mean, as much as we like to say we don't do it, but Christians can do it too. So I, I want to get really technical with you, and I do this because some pe sometimes people like to wiggle out of seeing things the way that they really are, especially when it comes to themselves. And so most of us realize that enjoying everything or anything other than God uh, from the best gift to the basest pleasure, it can become idolatry. Uh, again, Colossians 3, 5 calls it covetousness. It's the idea uh, that idolatry is this idea that where we want more, we need more, or, we, or we, we, we are satisfied with certain things in our life. And so it comes in so many forms, and our attraction to idols remains the same today, even though a lot of times we don't, look, like we may not be sitting there worshiping some statue or something. We, not be, we may not be worshiping some idol in that way. Uh, you know, made by human hands like a piece of wood or a piece of steel. But the, the truth is, is even though the names change, there are still, there's still idolatry. And so, in fact, let me just say this. Probably in your life, if you were to basically get down to the bottom 
of the problems that you have in your life. I mean, all human relational problems from whether it be marriage, whether it be family, whether it be friendships, neighbors, classmates, colleagues, all of them are rooted in forms, various forms of idolatry. I mean, that is, again, listen, what we're talking about is the idea where we're wanting things other than God in wrong ways. And you may say, well, okay, well, well didn't, didn't God give us things to enjoy? And the answer to that is how many of you are thankful and grateful that God did give us things to enjoy? I mean, he did. He did give us some things to enjoy. And you may say, well, that's great. Well, then, PT, what's the problem? Well, the question is, is this. How do I know if an enjoyment is, it, is, it, is an idolatrous thing or not? I mean, so that's a great question. I'm glad you asked me that question this morning. Thank you for asking. What turns a desire into covetousness, which is idolatry? I mean, here's a checklist to ask yourself. Want to know if your desire is wrong? There, there, there's some questions to ask yourself. Number one, is it, why don't we say it, we're talking about the enjoyment. Is the enjoyment forbidden by God? I mean, so for example, adultery, fornication, I mean, you start looking down the list, stealing. I mean, we all know the Ten Commandments, lying, they're forbidden by God, right? So listen, but some people go ahead and do them because, listen, some people feel that they're pleasurable. And listen, just because they're pleasurable doesn't mean that we go ahead and do them just because they're pleasurable. So we have to ask ourselves, is it something that God says to do or not to do? Uh, number two, does it make you forget God? <laughs> Chocolate cake makes me forget. <laughs> maybe, you think, maybe it makes you think that it, the gift itself is better than God himself. Oh, this is so much better than anything else. Listen, can I tell you, if it makes you forget God, it's probably idolatrous and it's probably an idol. Number three. Does it feel like a right instead of a gift? Which equally and oppositely, our delight in him becomes more of a demand to be met. I mean, then, then listen, it's, it's possibly an, an enjoyment in your life that's idolatrous. There are, especially, these are, by the way, these are especially true, number three, are especially true in delights and spiritual things like prayer, Bible reading, ministry. It's wonderful to experience holy things. It's wonderful to experience gifts from God, but it's idolatrous to feel proud that we can. I'm a Christian, and guess what? I'm proud of that. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah. Listen. Me on my best day, that's today this week. Just letting you know. That's today this week because I at least got pants on. You know what I'm saying? Yesterday I didn't put pants on. You know what I'm saying? How many of you know what I mean? There's days you just want to stay home. And you just want to just be like, and, and Terry's gone. And so, <laughs> you know what that means? If Terry's gone, I can do what I want, right? <laughs> I, can, I can like make the house a mess. I can leave piles of stuff places. It's really great. Now, she's coming home this afternoon, so I got to have it cleaned up before she gets home. <laughs> but I'm just saying. So, you know, listen. You know, there, there are things in this life, I, I cringe when I hear people say things like, well, I'm proud of my Pentecostal heritage. Just, say, just listen, listen, just say you're thankful, not you're proud. I, I, I understand what you mean. But listen, pride is not good. Pride in, in so many ways is not good. And I'm not talking about the kind of pride where you take pride. Listen, let me ask you this question. What part of your salvation did you pay for? What part of your salvation did you have? <laughs> Jesus came along and you were in quicksand and it was the quicksand of sin. And he came along and says, do you need me? And you say, no, really like you had a choice. I'm saying this because the truth is, is yes, we do have a choice. But the truth is, is like if it hadn't have been for him picking me up out of the miry clay, I would still be in the quicksand dead. And so listen. What part of that did I do? Well, I just grabbed onto his hand and hung on tight. <laughs> so understand this. I mean, so when I'm proud of something, listen, I'm not proud because of what I've done. I'm proud because of what he's done. I, he is amazing. He's awesome. He's all that in a box of chocolates, right? So listen, number four, does it draw you away from your biblical duties? We find ourselves spending time pursuing in the enjoyment, knowing that other things, mainly people who need our attention or ministry, I mean, that's what people, people are, is ministry, Ministry is not you just doing stuff or, you know, 
we, we would rather spend time, you know, how many of you enjoy a game of golf? Raise your hand high. Or you enjoy crocheting? Or you have a, how many of you have a hobby? Raise your hand high. Okay. Some of you need to get a hobby. <laughs> I can tell. So anyway, um, um, but, but uh, listen, if that hobby becomes more to you than doing the things of God, I mean, it can, it can really be messed up. Number five, does it awaken the sense of pride that you can experience this delight while other people can't? <laughs> and it probably is an idolatrous enjoyment. Number six, does it make you callous to the needs and desires of others? Holy enjoyment is aware of people's needs around them, not self-centered. I mean, so a person who is praying, it's going to, listen, I, 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 there was a pastor at a church I was at one time, and he was up front, and it was the funniest thing you've ever seen in your life. It wasn't intentional, but it happened. How many of you like it when stuff happens that's funny in church? It's a Tuesday night, and we're praying, and it's a serious prayer meeting. People are gathered around and praying, and people are praying out loud, and it's like, man, Jesus, I pray that you would just bring people off the street right here, Jesus. I pray that you would just take people that don't know you and bring them in. And in the back, a man walks in, and the pastor was irritated, and the people were irritated that there was a man walked in and mess, interrupted their prayer. I looked at it like this, uh, folks, Jesus just answered our prayer. <laughs> you know what I mean? So how many of you have ever had something, you know, you're trying to do something spiritual only to have somebody interrupt it, and it was actually a God interruption? So listen, it, sometimes, sometimes our enjoyment can make us callous, even spiritual enjoyments like praying. So number seven, does it make you not desire that Christ be magnified through that enjoyment? I mean, enjoying anything but Christ, is, like his good gifts, runs the inevitable risk of magnifying the gift over the giver. Number eight, does it create in you a holy delight for God? You know, chocolate cake is, is delightful, but it also makes me, I'm allergic to it, and I break out in fat. So, so... That's Rod's joke. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> does it create in you a holy delight toward the Lord? If not, then it's probably an, an idolatrous enjoyment. Number nine, when you lose the enjoyment, does it ruin your trust in the goodness of God? Ouch. I mean, then it was probably an idolatrous enjoyment. Listen, it's also why I think this is a wonderful prayer that we need to learn to pray. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. And there's way more to the context of what I'm just about to read to you. But understand this. It says this, little children, keep yourself from idols. And the reason that warning is there is because idols appeal to our old nature. Idols appeal to things that... Like, listen, that, that we may be in Christ, if you're in Christ and you've been in Christ for a while, listen, you remember how it was beforehand. I'm saying this, you remember how it was before you followed Jesus Christ. And so listen, it, it, it can become so easy to begin to lie to ourselves. So for example, we just looked at King Saul. Saul believed and even confessed, I have obeyed God. He said, oh, Samuel, no, 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 you misunderstand this thing. I did exactly what the Lord said, yet but because he wasn't, didn't fully obey but rather chose to put the people's desire, more actually, probably appropriately interpreted, he put his own desires in front of God's desires. And, it, and listen, here's what idolatry does. It, it blinds us. It, it blinded Saul to his own contempt for God himself. Listen, again, I don't know if you remember the last couple of weeks we've been talking about this. The root of Saul's adultery, it's not statues. It's not figurines. It's not altars or temples. I mean, listen, rather, it was not giving God due worship, which should have been in the form of obedience. So this core behavior leads to unknowingly Doing like Romans says, and we, we went through Romans for a year, and I know that sounds like a long time, but the truth is, it's like it was just breaking the ground, exchanging the truth for a lie. And so what happens is, is deception begins to take a hold of a person, and, and in this case, Saul, it leads him to foolish thinking. It leads him to saying some really dumb things and doing things that really should never be done. And so now... With all that said, I want to stop right here for a second and take a look at why we are all here. 
I want you to think of this. I mean, most of us here are here. Most of us in the room are here because we want to follow Jesus. That might be our stated intent. I mean, I follow Jesus. I want to go and I want to learn more about Jesus. I mean, we, we know that our only hope, some of you in the room, you know that your only hope is in him. You know that your only hope is, is Jesus Christ. We know that he provides hope and he provides life and he provides uh, uh, not just the giftings uh, to be able to be used in his kingdom, but listen, he is the answer not just to all of our problems, but he is the source of joy in spite of those problems that we might have and he's the great God of the universe and we want to glorify him. That's, that's why we're here. The problem comes when you and I, we get sidetracked by some of the trickiest idols in our lives that really, honestly, sometimes we don't even see because these tricky idols can create disastrous results. And the tragic result in Saul's life was that his life, it grew more wicked. It grew more, it, 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 it went away from the things of God. It went away from God. I mean, so if you read the rest of the story of Saul's life, listen, here's what happens after all this happens. He becomes jealous. He becomes demanding. He becomes unreasonable. He's, he goes through fits of rage. He goes, uh, he's a hateful attacker of God's servants, people like David himself, uh, a shepherd boy who was just a kid after God's heart. Uh, he, was a, he became a murderer. I mean, he, he even consulted a witch instead of uh, consulting God. I mean, you start going down the list of all the things that Saul does, and often those who have a relationship with God, and yet they choose their own desires over what He's clearly revealed through Scripture. What happens is is they begin to become blind to their own disobedience. Listen, real simply said, if you're following notes on the app, it's this. I mean, idolatry, it does. It it, it blinds us. It, it, It doesn't allow us to see what's there. It doesn't allow us to see the truth. I mean, we, we now have exchanged that truth for deception. And the crazy thing is, is we still believe God is on our side. And we think he understands our heart. And maybe you believe he, he even condones our behavior and approves of our lifestyle. But yet in reality, we are in opposition to him and have made ourselves into something we never saw coming. You might say, well, what is that? Listen, the Bible says very clearly in Romans that we are an enemy of God when we're Doing, going against the ways of God. And so that's where, that's where godly sorrow comes in. I mean, now, there are three different scenarios when it comes to believers in sin. First, there are professing believers who overlook sin because of their hardened hearts. That's group number one. Group number two, that there are professing Christians who believe that the lie that we are all by nature sinners, that the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to only free us from the penalty of sin, which is true but not from bondage to it. Let me just tell you, that's not true. And these two groups being given to sin are like kryptonite in the body of Christ, bringing weakness to the entire body because of their their willful disobedience to, to Christ, like we talked about a couple weeks ago. However, there's a third group of people And this is the group of people I want to talk to today. I I, I mean, I I believe the first two, they speak for themselves. You have to ask yourself, "Am am I a believer with a hardened heart? Am I a believer who just, you know, doesn't really want to be free from my sin? I mean, the first two things. This third group, though, I have to ask this question because there are believers who really are, they are sincerely struggling to get free from sin. And and this is the group I'm talking to today. And the first thing I want to say is is this. Can I tell you something? Jesus, outside of him turning somebody over to a reprobate mind, which is a whole other issue. I don't want to go into that today. I'm not going to, that's a whole other sermon series, okay? I'm just going to tell you. But when we are talking about the idea of Jesus forgiving, God is a God who forgives. God is a God who forgives. Listen, unless the Lord would turn you over to a reprobate mind, which is, again, a subject for another day, and at that point, you wouldn't ask for forgiveness anyway because you would be too far gone. So 
But for a saint who is trying to get free from sin, God sees the torment that your sin brings you every time you fall, and he knows you truly do want to be free. And by his grace, by his power, let me just tell you something, today he can help you. And so I know people today who are, you're here and, and for many years, uh, th- they weren't free. Maybe you're here and you've been freed, but you weren't free at one point uh, because of addiction to pornography. I mean, you look at it, I mean, we've, we've, had, we've had people who've prayed here even before and they said they, they seemingly have struggled over and over and over, they just couldn't seem to get free. Oh. Others, we, we prayed and there was a struggle, but they kept swimming against the current and developing a prayer closet in their life, developing a prayer life, seeking more of Jesus, just kept swimming toward Jesus, and eventually it seemingly lost its hold on that person. And so, but my point is, is most people's freedom from this doesn't come until there is a change of priorities. I know a pastor who in the beginning of his ministry, he wanted God to free him from this because he was worried that his sin would get in the way of the ministry. Listen, let me ask you this question. Does sin get in the way of the ministry? It sure does. But should that be the biggest thing we're worried about? Some of you are like, I don't know. Maybe. This pastor friend of mine then says this. My heart shifted, and I began to focus on how my decisions were affecting not just what my church that I was over, but how my decisions were affecting my intimacy with Jesus. I started caring about how my sin affected God and whether it pleased him or not. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, Paul contrasts two kinds of sorrow. I mean, we, we all have heard, I mean, most of us, if you've been in church any amount of time at all, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, I mean, it's very, very easy, very simple. Uh, and really, there's a couple of different kinds of, of, of sorrow here. First one is godly sorrow, and that, sorrow, that kind of sorrow leads to salvation. And then there's a second kind of sorrow that's worldly, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a sorrow that ends in death. And so what I'm saying to you illustrates both of these sorrows. At first, listen, that pastor friend of mine, his sorrow was worldly, worrying about what would happen to him, worried about what would happen. Listen, it, it, it can sound real great to say, I'm worried it's going to happen in the church, but listen, it was also his livelihood. So, but later his sorrow, it became godly, concerned over how his own sin hurt God, how it hurt other people around him. And here's the truth. There is no turning to God without repentance, godly sorrow. And the best news is, is it's also, the, the, here's the best news. <laughs> That's the entire reason Jesus came. It's the entire reason he came is to free us from the bondage of sin, to call sinners to repentance. Luke chapter 5, verse 3, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous. Listen, that's that's why Jesus was so hard on religious people. Well, I'm great. I'm the best thing since sliced bread. I'm a Pharisee. Jesus was like, eh, you know what I mean? I'm just saying this. He's calling people who need repentance. They understand that they need repentance. Notice the word need here in this verse. Repentance is not optional. Sarah and the team, you guys would make your way back and begin to play. Listen, this morning, you could come down. You may say, well, that was really quick. Um, I'm not done yet. But (laughs) just saying, uh, as as the team is making their way back, you could come down here this morning. I'm just going to tell you this. You could cry your eyes out and still not have godly sorrow over your sin. And my point is this, and listen, if God does a work in you this morning, that's not what we're here, I'm not sitting here looking at that. What I'm, I, I'm, what I'm here to tell you is this. Could it be true that sometimes people cry over more? It's like your kids. How many of you ever, when you were younger, you, you were crying and your mom and your dad, they got onto you and they were, they were upset at you and maybe you even got swats or whatever, and some of you didn't get swats and you needed swats. But anyway, um, <clears throat> but you got swats and you're crying. And, <sighs> and how many of you ever were crying for reasons other than the fact that you were being corrected? How many of you were crying because you were mad? Because that hurt? 
How many of you were crying because you were like, I don't know who he thinks he is. Tell me what to do. Because you're the kid, right? And the dad is only the dad, right? That's, that's what we think at, at five years old, six years old. How many of you were crying over things? That, listen, there's a lot of things you could come and I could cry because I got caught. Or I could cry because the situation is bad. Or I could cry because, listen, but if I'm crying over the fact that I'm offending Jesus, the one who gave his nail-scarred hands to me, the one who died in my place for my sin? My point is, if you cry over more what happened as a result of your sin than your own sin over offending Jesus, it's not godly sorrow. And the only fix is for, you, for God to do a miraculous work in you, which would, first of all, listen, I'm going to say this, it would scare you into realizing that God actually grants us repentance. You may be, what do you mean by that? Acts 11 talks about it. 2 Timothy 2 talks about it. Repentance is not just, oh, well, I just decided to follow him. No, the Lord made it to where he, you could see your sin and you could see what your sin was doing to not just you, but to the people around you, to God, to, to everyone. And so it's, it's, it's God actually granting you the ability to be able to really be repentant and say, you know what? These tears aren't just because I got caught. These tears are the result of, I don't want to offend Jesus anymore. I don't, want to st- I don't want to start offending God in my life every single day of my life simply for the fact that unless he changes your heart, listen, you are without hope. And you might end up in a place called hell. And again, there's no turning to God without godly sorrow. Jesus and the disciples made this clear everywhere they went. I love this. I mean, Jesus was like, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I mean, you think about it, the disciples later on, they took on that same mantra. And even the rich man that told Jesus, hey, you know what? I don't know if I really want to give up all of that I have. He didn't want to give up all of his riches, and he knew this truth. He knew the truth that Jesus was giving. He knew that there was no turning to God without godly sorrow. There's no salvation without repentance. And later, Peter in in Acts 2, he's preaching and he wants the crowd to know how to be saved. And he says this, Peter replied, each of you must, what? Repent of your sins and turn to God. Again, there's no turning to God without godly sorrow, which is repentance. Again, in Acts chapter 26, verse 20. He says, I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove that they have changed by the good things they do. And notice it's, it's not all should. It's not all, it's, it's a good idea if you repent. It's a good idea. No, it's, it's you must repent. In other words, it's a requirement for anybody. I don't care who you are. Listen, the Bible says it in Galatians like this, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, barbarian, Scythian, What that translates nowadays is this black, white, brown, whatever. It doesn't matter what you are. Jesus wants to change your life and to take this concept a step further. Acts chapter 17. Paul is preaching in Athens. And it says he tells these people while he's preaching them daily in the public square and in the synagogues where he actually ends up being taken to the high council of Athens. He says this. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now he commands everyone everywhere to repent their sins and turn to him. And the writer of Hebrews calls it, he says, basic teaching. It's basic, simple teaching. I mean, repentance is basic. I mean, so, so let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature and understand. And what does that basic teaching look like? Well, he says this. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds. Listen, the point I'm making this morning is this. There is no placing your faith in your Lord Jesus Christ unless there is first repentance from known disobedience to God. So my point is is this. I I want to even take this further. Let me ask you. Do you think that God would want you to stay in sin if he delivered you from it? Maybe I need to get a little closer to you. That was not a rhetorical question. Some of you are afraid to answer. No, right? No, absolutely not. I mean, God's not going to deliver you from it only to have you stay in it. My point is this. You can't stay a Christian 
and continually, willfully hang on to porn. You'll go the other direction and that's not okay. You'll go off the edge. You can't become or stay a believer if you refuse to stop having sex with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Just that's what I'm going to do. Because, listen, I don't care what God says. Really? You can't become a believer and refuse to turn away from homosexuality. You can't b- become and stay a believer if you refuse to stop cheating on your taxes. I just don't want to quit doing any of that. I mean, it's, it's helping me. Listen, you can't become and stay a believer if you're going to cling to every kind of gender perversion there is. You can't become and stay a believer if you refuse to forgive people. The point being, the Lord is supposed to be the stronghold of your life, not you. And the bigger point is this, is that if we insist on clinging to the limited parts of what the New Testament commands, then we, what we have is we have created a, a golden calf in our image. And we are just like, wow, man, this is, this is what I want to worship right here. Oh, oh, yeah, it's still Yahweh. It's still God. See, here he is. We've created in our minds and we've deceived ourselves in our own hearts. And our faith is, listen, the Bible says it's only imaginative. We are warned in places like James 1.22 where he says, don't just listen to God's word and so deceive yourself. We must also, we must do what it says. So this morning, in order to be married to Jesus, the bottom line is this, this last message of this last piece in this series. In order to, in order to be married to Jesus, You have to walk away from your old love. And I'm not talking about physically walking away from a person, although that might end up being that. I'm not saying that, but what you have to walk away from your old desire. You have to walk away from your old nature. You have to walk, you have to allow Jesus Christ to change you from the inside out. And listen, I'm telling you something. He can do it. I've watched him do it time and time again. If he can do it with me, he can do it with you. If he can do it with people, if he can do it with Mauricio, he can do it with everybody. How many of you know that? There are those of you today. Heads bowed, eyes closed this morning as Terrence, Sarah, and the team are still playing. There are those of you today who are still dating other loves. You're here and you claim Christ, but the truth of the word today, the truth of the word has exposed things in your heart. And you have idols in your life that you need to lay down. And you cannot serve God and you cannot serve these idols in the same way at the same time. God will not allow it. And listen, you're here and you know that. You know that to be true. Today, you're being confronted by Holy Spirit. He's here. He's here to work in your heart. And you, listen, you're here and you're saying, hey, (laughs) I know I've been a believer and I've been walking with Jesus and I know I need to repent today. I want you right now, right where you're at, I just want you just to slip your hand up to heaven this morning. You're a believer and you've been following Jesus, but there is... There's been some things, there's been some idols that have crept in. There's been some things that have crept into your life and you know that you need to get rid of those. I want you just right now, right where you're at. Nobody looking around, heads, heads bowed, eyes closed. Hands up right now. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. God sees your hand. I want to pray over you right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these hands. We thank you for these people, Lord God, who are honest before you today, oh God. Lord, you want to be the king of our hearts. Lord, you want to be the king of our lives. And so, God, I pray that every single person that's in here, this place today, that, Lord, that true repentance happens in these moments. God, we pray that, Lord, that as they've raised their hands, if they lifted their hands to you, God, Lord, that they are identifying themselves as repentant. God, I, I know I need your help in these areas, oh, God. God, you can deliver and you can save and you can free people and you can help them become. They can go from glory to glory to glory in you, in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing that. Thank you for granting repentance to your people. Heads heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning. There are still other people before we open up this altar time. There are still other people who maybe you're here and you're, maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you're here for the fifth time. Maybe you're here for the 40th time. I don't know. But there are other people here that actually, you're hearing all this, but you have not given your life to Jesus. You have not given your life to him. You've not called on Jesus to be the Lord of your life. This morning, this moment right here, he's calling out to you. He loves you with an everlasting love. 
He gave his life for you at the cross. You have to count the cost. Will you take up your cross? Will you count all things lost and die to yourself and follow him today? Until you do, the Bible says that God's wrath is upon anyone who's unrepentant. That's what it says in Romans. Today, you want to repent of all your sins. Today, you're like, man, I I want Jesus to free me. Listen, his, his sacrifice is your ultimate fix. He has made a way for God to forgive you by taking your place. And the book of Romans says, when he died, now you died. And the book of Romans says that because he rose again, you can also rise again. In other words, you can be free from your sin. You too can become victorious and a, and a conqueror. You're here this morning and you know, know you need to give your life to Jesus today. I want you right now, I want you just to slip your hand up before heaven right now. Nobody looking around. You just slip your hand up right to heaven this morning. This is a battle right now, but go ahead. Yes, yes. Anyone else? You know you need Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. You want to make him the Lord of your life. You want to make him the Lord of your life. Yes. You're willing to renounce your sin and say, you know what, I've I want to leave that old life behind me. I need Jesus to change me from the inside out. Thank you, Jesus. I've seen five hands to my left so far. Are there any others right now across this sanctuary? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I love it when people come to Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. This is a holy moment right now. I love this. Five people have decided, I want to follow Jesus Christ. Is that not awesome? I want to do something. I want us to stand right where we're at right now. In just a moment, There's not going to be a real formal ending to this after we pray. Five people have decided to say, hey, I want to follow Jesus Christ with all my heart and all my life. And just so you know, the five that raised their hand across this sanctuary, the five that raised their hand, there's going to be some people connect with you. And we want to help make sure you got a Bible. We want to help make sure you've you, you understand what you're getting yourself into. I'm just saying this. I'm not saying that like it's, like it's bad. I'm saying that, listen, how many of you know that we don't just take when a baby's born yesterday? Yeah, Sean. Yeah. When a baby's born, we don't just go, okay, go down there and take care of yourself now. Right? And when, when we're born into the, when we become new creations, old things pass away, old things become new. Listen, we're going to try to come alongside. And here's the reason. Because we're not just a church that shows up on Sunday. We're a church that's a family. Can I tell you something? We're a family, and our family just expanded by five people this morning. Isn't that not cool? Yeah. Amen. So, so I'm not wanting to get this out of the way, but I'm excited about this. I Five people are going to repent this morning and ask Jesus to be the Lord of their life. And so can we all pray this prayer together with him? If you're one of the five, you pray this like you mean it with all of your heart. And I'm saying this because God is going to do a miracle in your heart and in your life today. He's going to forgive you of your sin. Listen, I I know that there's things that we do that make us feel like we need to forgive ourselves. Let me tell you something. The the one that the one that matters. The one that really matters is when Jesus forgave me of all my sin and it causes me to have some self-esteem about me. Jesus changed my life for forever. And listen, he put me on a, on a track. He put me on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, a, a rail station going the right direction. Listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that everything I've ever done since that's happened has been good. How many of you know that? How many of you, we all need Jesus even after we get saved. So the truth is, is I mean, I'm just saying this like, He's setting people in a new direction. You came and you met face to face with your sin. You're like going, I, I've had enough of this, right? I need Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. And you turn to him and you begin to run toward him and you run toward him the rest of your life. 
This morning is just a prayer to begin to say, God, I need you in my life. I need you to forgive my sins. I need, I'm repentant today. I'm sorry for my sin. So can we do this right now? Can we all pray this together? Father God, I realize that you gave us your son Jesus to die in my place so that I could be forgiven of all my sin. And today I realize that my sin separates me from you. That's why you sent Jesus. So I ask you to forgive me and cast my sin as far as the east is from the west and remember my sin no more. I ask you to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can follow you all the days of my life. Make your home in me. I want to be your dwelling place so that I can live for you here on earth. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. May I always follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody in the house said, can we give God praise in this place? In Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to have you guys sing. No formal introduction. If you need to come down and you need to lay some idols down, if you need to come down and you need to just say, I want to just experience God, maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know what? I'm afraid because I don't feel like repentant. Can I tell you something? God can change your heart. Come down here and ask God to help give you a soft heart before him. How many of you know we all need a soft heart before him? And I'm not talking about the physical boom, 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 boom. I'm talking about your volition, your will, your, your mind, your will, your emotions. We're talking about that. You need to become pliable before the Lord. Make your way down. We're going we're gonna to just begin to sing. Let the king of my heart you can make your way down. Be the mountain where I run. Be the fire.